talking about the heavy tea roast. We're in Numbskull Studios, and we've got Mark in studio from Cutting Edge Solutions, and now we've got John. Okay. John from Cutting Edge Solutions, founder. The founder, the master. Genius up there at Cutting Edge Solutions. What's up, John? Welcome, John. Yes, hi. How are you guys doing? Hello, John. We're doing well. We're just talking politics. You know, it's a political show now. <laughs> <laughs> we well, vote. yeah, I vote, you know, and uh, it's, it's funny, we have... We have K-Mud Radio up here, and it's usually a lot of political talk, and uh, somehow I squeeze a few words in there once in a while. But um, <laughs> right so, so Mark is there with his dog on his lap. I'm at our research greenhouse in Humboldt looking at mites through a microscope. So, oh, so, so you, you do- anybody on your show before and that's what they're doing looking at mites. Well, there are a lot of people out there that are not growing plants. They're just farming mites. I and, saw and mine last there's night. a big problem with mites, you know, especially with in California, the the previous year being so hot. There's not a lot of uh, population loss of insects because it's been so warm throughout the winter. So it seems that they're more ferocious than ever this summer. So people need to be prepared, use preventative maintenance and then treat them accordingly, uh, uh, like we always preach over here. But with mites, John, how do you handle your mites? Well, um, you know. There's all these different spray programs in order to, to kind of keep mites down or suppress them somewhat, but they still, you know, in fact, really the area of Humboldt that I'm in right now is an example of creating spray programs to breed resistance for the mites. So they just go through everything. And in Colorado, it's even worse. So what we're doing here is um, I've been waiting a few years to work with his PhD entomologist with 50 years experience at total success using predator mites and predator bugs to control other bug populations and uh, it, actually it, has sun working here too. Are you finding uh, though that that's a viable option for you know <laughs> such a short lifespan plant that we're, we're have a flowering plant for two months basically is it time enough for the predator uh, insects to actually take care of uh, insect infestation? Yeah, well, you know, you just have to choose your predator mites. Um, in this case, we've harvested native and local uh, feeder mites, let's call them, mites that live off of uh, um, not plants but flour, like baking flour. And, you know, you can collect those in bakeries and you can go into feed stores and mites that live off feed, these are really a good source for food for the predator mite. And then the predator mites, I mean, you know, look outside. Not everything is eaten to death. Why? Because there's some major predators out there, you know, honing their skills. Take those out of nature, bring them in, breed those. And that's what they did at the Biosphere. The super mite. One of the secrets, though, is... You know, because you've probably used predator bugs before, and they may or may not have worked. They have to be released at the right time. They need to be fresh. And they need a a more complete food source. And so we grow host plants in order to raise pollen to give the the predator mites this superfood. So the in-between times after they've devoured all the mites in their path, they can build up some strength to go after the rest of them, lay eggs, and then their eggs hatch earlier than the two-spotted mite, the russet mite, and the very hated broad mite. So when, when you have these populations built up and we are only you know, in a light-depth greenhouse or an indoor grow, we are basically 8 to 12 weeks cycle from uh, changing the light cycle 12-12 to the harvest. Are you able to maintain those populations in a way um, in between switching out the plants inside your greenhouse or your indoor grow? Uh, And if so, how do you do that? Well, Or or do you just start over every time? Right. To get it to work every time, we are developing those techniques. We've only really just started this program, and it's only in response to a lot of growers. I mean, we have people in this area of Humboldt that have that are losing their fuchsia plants oh. to, to broad mites. You know, and, they, and I know this because I've gone out and I've pulled samples and taken, taken them out to our microbiology lab, and, and you have to actually cut open the leaf and look for 
for broad mice because you can't see them with your eyes. Yeah, and they move so fast, it's hard to identify with a microscope. You actually have to capture them or cut it open so you can see the damage. Right, it's when they actually get into the leaf and start feeding that, uh, you know, you can you, you notice the area that's, that's people think is some sort of deficiency or, or hemp streak virus or tobacco virus or tomato mosaic virus or all these different things. And in, in reality, it's, it's actually where the mite is. And then you cut into there and you can easily see the mite at high po- with a high power compound scope. Yeah, I mean, they- holding up, you know, something to look through that's like five or 15 times, it's just not going to do it to be able to see the mites. And, and it's and, kind you know, everybody of the- sees this damage, right? They, I know this because when anything goes wrong, it's the fertilizers. We're the first people they blame. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. Them, I, I own two hydro wrong. shops. I know. It's it's uh, it's us. Or or it was my advice. <laughs> the fuck so, them up. You know, we deal with a lot of different people that have plant diseases, and now. But when someone have, thinks you know, they have a virus, virus John, if, if someone thinks they have a virus, viruses in the in plants are very very rare, right? They well, certain plants, yes. Let's just say they're rare because. When you've got enough, uh, you know, genetic diversity, you're you generally don't see viruses. It's when you start doing a lot of inbreeding, a lot of monoculture, recessive qualities that you want in the plant. Okay. And then sometimes you take along a susceptibility to a disease. So, you know, you uh, you can get blights, you know, which are bacterial infections, which kind of mimic viruses in a way, in any way in diagnosis from just walking out in the field. And sometimes, you know, you just go in one direction too far trying to claim some genetics and you put yourself into a dead end. Right. Right. I mean, in the 70s, we almost did that with the, the whole corn crop when we had, you know, southern corn blight. Well, we looked the, out like seventy percent of the corn crop. Well, we could go on forever about the monoculture um, planting that's going on in our current agricultural system, and um, you know, there's a great piece on it on the news, um, the HBO series Vice about monoculture and what we're setting ourselves up for if there happens to be a specific virus, a, a specific bacteria or pathogen that attacks these monocultures that we basically put all of our eggs in one basket, which is stupid as fuck. Like anyone that is a businessman, capitalism and stuff, you say don't put all your eggs in all, in one basket. It's like, yeah, you got to spread it around to diversify have some, to have some security, and we're not security. doing that right now in our <laughs> in July. But anyways, yes, anyways, security in July. I, I feel you on those points, John. But let, let's talk a little bit about cutting edge solutions and how how it came about because you were a long time grower, still are a farmer, a gardener. Um, and you wanted something different, so you decided to take the bull by the balls and do it yourself. Tell us a little bit about how Cutting Edge came about. Well, I kind of, you know, taking the bull by the balls, I'd rather ride the cow. <laughs> Me too. But, uh, he, he knows your wife, Dr. Duff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. he, you're welcome anytime. <laughs> the, the, uh, I don't know, you know, I've, I've, always, I've always gardened, and, uh, you, you know, I've always been interested in growing plants, and... You know, then I got interested in fungi and the relationships of plants. But um, I love fungi. You know, it's kind of growing. You start growing large-scale crops. Like, for instance, in 1990, I worked with uh, an international plant breeder and the Mapuche Indians from southern Chile to grow quinoa. Mm. And you know, I just I was in Berkeley, and I uh, you know I came across quinoa, and it's just it's just a plant and a food that spoke to me. And um, I just, I knew I just had to farm it. And, you know, you get out on about 150 acres and you're, you know, in uh, northeast California out, you know, by uh, Aden and Bieber and probably places you've never heard of before, all the way out on the other 299, five hours from Arcata. When you're out there, you're kind of on your own. I mean, there's big ag and, uh, you know, they're not doing things like that. My idea of growing quinoa was from the quinopodium family where, you know, spinach is. It's a three-lobe leaf, and it can take moisture in from the air because it has large stomates. It doesn't use much water. And I saw...
future that there was going to be, you know, big water crisis because everyone's looking up in that section of the state. It's the lakes and, you know, the rivers up mm-hmm. here and, uh, and wanting to drain it for big ag in the valley. So, you know, I, I knew that I had to come up with some sort of foliar spray. And, you know, the beginning of hum tea was, the, was right there because I realized that, you know, there's sugar beet farmers. And, you know, I went up there because I could get uh, alfalfa land that wasn't productive anymore because it cost too much to put all the chemicals into it. So after three years, it could be certified organic, which is what I was after. But the drift from planes that could potentially hit the crop and decertify me was huge. Right. And so I looked at that and thought, you know, I got this big investment and I need to protect it by uh, creating a a couple by pulling together a couple strains of bacteria, Pseudomonas being one of them, Bacillus, and an Azobacter, that could unwind herbicides, pesticides, and uh, some chemical spray and, and chemical carriers for some of the micronutrients they sprayed on in case of drift, because I was OCA, OCIA certified. Which meant that an inspector, I mean, that was like the real deal organic, where right. an inspector can just randomly show up in your field and pull leaf samples. So I had to have a way to be able to um, run the wheel line irrigation and put out this bacteria to be able to to unwind a pesticide or an herbicide or something like that that might be sprayed. And it just pulls the you know hydrogen hydrogens and carbons apart and the oxygen just fall out. So um, and it also would work you know for paraquat or you know it's spraying other crops too. So you know I figured it might come in really handy. <laughs> I think you should have got a machine gun and. You know, shoot down those planes. Decontaminate. Cheaper. <laughs> well, you know, they're just other farmers. And yeah, I'll shoot that, them down. You know, and that's told by the bank. It's a threat. You know? I mean, these are people that, you know, kind I'm of... I'm a livelihood. They, I'm American. <laughs> Libertarian. No, I, I guess as violent as you can possibly get is, you know, watching predator bugs devour broad mites. And that, to me, is totally pleasing. Sexy. So... <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is sexy. Sounds cool. He, he, he's got his battle royales. All right, in this corner, predator mite extraordinaire. <laughs> we fed on wheat, wheat flower mites for 17 weeks. Against horny spider mites. Weighing in at a total of point zero 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 two milligrams. <laughs> Uncle John's <laughs> living legend. <laughs> champion of the world. <laughs> the hungry, hungry hippo predator mite. <laughs> Here to That's gobble fine. them up. <laughs> chomp, chomp. <laughs> Going up against Horty Chris's Thousand Mites. Going against Horty Chris's making fun of special kids. Uh, so it's horrible. horrible. No, but no, it's good because, you know. You're blowing my mind right now, by the way. I'm What's pretty. That? It might have been the safety meeting I had before you got on, but pretty much my mind is blown. I feel dizzy. <laughs> Do you not well, all feel dizzy? Not. No, I'm just paying attention. Okay. <laughs> I think it's my heart arrhythmia. <laughs> You know, I was kind of doing the same thing. I took a break. I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to be on the radio for a while. So I'd... the beach is like half a mile away. So I went down a little, little river. Rub beach, it in. And I was just walking along, oh. looking at Trinidad Head, going, wow, this is really great. I'm really feeling relaxed. I'm really, whoa, it's quarter to six. He's like, running, running, running. Across running. The sand, jump in the truck. And... <laughs> That's what's up. That's what's up. So you were on the quinoa farm. You, mm-hmm. you, you brought your, your first product was hum tea then. It is is was started at all? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, well, you know, that was like the start of hum tea. It was, you know, uh, finding indigenous organisms that already work in our environment and can compete chemical fertilizers and now, chemical pesticides. No, exactly. So so it's basically basically survival of the fittest. But you're telling me because I understand the survival of the fittest with other microorganisms, with pathogens, with things that are living. Now you're talking about herbicides and pesticides that they can actually biologically clean the plant of these? Yes. Or the soil? Yes. They, yeah, you can, you can Ooh, break yeah. those down. Um, Decontaminate is a great word. There you go. Take salty yeah. soil and remove the salt organically with biomechanisms. Hey, how does that, how does that oh, work, yeah. John? So, uh, you know, one of the things that we have in hum tea is, is Pseudomonas pudida, P-U-T-I-D-A. And these are all uh, organisms that are just, we use a worm casting that we developed 
that has all of these components in it. We use our lab to check to make sure these components are at a certain level or these or organisms that are at a certain level so that we know that the product is going to work the same every time. But something like Pseudomonas pudida, can it can pretty much tear through any, any kind of man-made thing. The, uh, the salts themselves, you know, our, our whole product line is the lowest in sodium of any fertilizer. But when you use other fertilizers and it, they do have sodium in it, the sodium will attach to the bacteria and then leach out of the system. And so, it, so the bacteria will neutralize the salts. And, and, like, and then it does the I mean, same for the for the pesticides. Salt, but you know, it's not really a correct term. But what I what is, it, is it is sodium it sodium and heavy metals? Is it basically a biological chelation then? Um, you know, our additives are a biological chelation. Okay, but the process that we're talking about, fungi. but the process we're talking about with the hum tea, they're they're not actually um, digesting and removing the pesticides or salts. It, it, it's not that type of process. Well, it breaks it down into basic components that are then, you know, it's kind of like the nothing is ever created or destroyed law of thermodynamics, right? I mean, everything that's on the earth pretty much. I don't know, man. I, I just went to state school. You dropped Berkeley and shit. I know you got a big brain, dog. <laughs> <laughs> the master. No, so the other day I was talking to this physicist, and he was explaining to me why we're going to run out of helium. We're going to run out of helium because the helium is so light it's not affected by the Earth's gravity, but it's able to be pulled by the sun and the moon. So it's going to be and gone. And when they line up, it's extreme. That's why we're losing helium off the planet. And then he went into all the details, and I was like, okay. I thought it was from I, making all those DuckTales movies. I thought it was yeah. Vinny Stone tweaking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Winning. John, let's get to the flagships. Winning. We've got the Hum Tea. Um, a great product is it sets itself apart from a lot of the other teas on the market. Um, it's a specific uh, worm casting that you guys have created. Was that, that called Pua That is added into it to facilitate the process processes that we just talked about. But let's talk about the the flagships, the the three part, right? We we see a lot of three parts out there that are the grow blue micro style green uh, three parts. What, what is different about cutting-edge solutions compared to other three parts? They probably didn't have to take plant pathology classes that are really extremely <laughs> long labs. And if you, screw up your, if you screw up your project, then you have to retake the class, and you don't get to party at all. No girlfriend. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, so no fun. you get good. you got to get good at something. So you realize, huh, why don't I just screw all these Ag chemicals. Well, I thought and you were going to say your great girlfriend. Compounds. Why don't I just use, you know, monopotassium phosphate from Belgium that they use in Gatorade and Sobe drinks? Hey, why not do that? And then I don't have to use a balloon booster. But back then I thought if I use really specific but not pharmaceutical grade components, I can get the same results each time and then I can add disease and see how the disease takes the plant and know that it's not a mineral deficiency or a fertilizer mm -hmm. Torture deficiency. test. So you, you follow me? Well, what I'm yeah. saying? So then let me, let me try, try to follow you a little bit here, John, is that you saw an opportunity to bring better ingredients, food-grade ingredients, into a system uh, that is going to be not just healthier for your plants but healthier for the environment. That's very true. That, is, that, that hits it right on, let's say, the mark. Absolutely. You, you talk about, uh, you know, uh, the viability of your soil and sustainability. Yes. You know, modern agriculture processes we've been using for the last 80 or 100 years or so, we're destroying our soil, our, the friability, the vitality of the soil. Friability? Friability. The yeah, you can look that one up today. <laughs> friability. Uh, that Doctor means, does friability <laughs> is very high. <laughs> so the idea is, you know, I, I, I grew up, you know, I've been doing this for 13 years. I knew people that would just toss their soil after every harvest. Yeah. It blew my mind. And I remember back in the days before I learned about cutting edge, talking about that salt, you know, scrubbing reservoirs full of salt. Uh, and, hardies. you know, when you're not filling your nutrients and your, or you're filling your reservoir and filling your medium with salt, uh, it, we're talking about sustainability. 
Absolutely, absolutely. You know what, John? Not to interrupt you, but Dr. <laughs> Dove talking just, about practice. Dr. Pra- Dove just gave me the signal that he has a brand new Dove product coming out next week. Uh-huh. Yes, Dr. Dove man here. Hey, did you hear about my new bacteria? It's called Pubacock. That's right. It releases its power on salt buildup. What? Yeah, this stuff's so powerful, it will clean the salt out of Horty's nose so he can breathe at night. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's really salt or something else, but you know what? It's awesome. Hey, get my poopacock now. It's the bacteria that kills and cleans. Hey, if you want a garden that's going to be no salt buildup, no lockout, it's called the freaking poopacock. <laughs> Boobacock! Get the boobacock now! Boobacock! Okay, it's you my failed. Up, man. Failure. All right, you can cut his mic off now. Turn off his mic, absolutely, 100%. <laughs> you don't like my boobacock? Interrupt him. Interrupt him. No, no, really. it, it's kind of like that crazy. I work with this Lebanese microbiologist, and uh, he, was pretty much of a, he was pretty much of a character. He's like a third-generation uh, microbiologist from, from Lebanon, and he actually, his grandfather was the guy who uh, worked with the Germans, unfortunately. They forced him to. But... Uh, you know, they're invading North Africa, and they're getting dysentery, and they were looking for a cure. And a lot of the and they drank locals tea. touched camel dung and touched it on their tongue. Ugh. Why? Because that's where Bacillus subtilis came from. There we that go. one bacteria that's super popular in yeah. all these things, Absolutely, right? yeah. We, we all see it. camel dung, and then the Germans isolated it out, and then they stopped getting dysentery. Camel guano. Hold on. Head explode. <laughs> my head has exploded. Where have you been on my life, John? Why are you my number one guest every week? <laughs> We're here Holy for you, bro. Holy moly, man. Hey, Not- so we've got the three part, though. We've got the hum tea. Cutting right. edges all over the place. You know, you people look at your sugar additives, and they look at it, hey, another sugar additive. I already use molasses, so why should I add sugary? Why should I add sour D? Uh, what's the difference between... The molasses that people are adding to their soils compared to your specific sugar products. Well, you know, one of the things about molasses is it's it's great. You know, and it's one of the components that's in hum tea with, you know, in one of the little packets. But um, the difference be- between like that and sugary and sour tea is plant esters open up a sig- the smell right that you smell when you open up one of those bottles. The plant esters open up a signal pathway from the roots, and there's organic sugar, and there's amino acids that complex the phosphorus that's left over in the soil that you don't want there anyway, and you don't want it to leach out. Right. You already paid for it, right? And the phosphor and the potassium that's in the sugary or sour D, it becomes a sugar chelation that can move into the plant with it and push further amino acid production. So the esters opening up the signal pathway bring everything right up to the top of the plant. So when you have sugary and sour D and the right levels of manganese, that is going to push terpene production. So triple A terpene you know, yeah. production is key. Because you know, I, 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 I always think there's the entourage effect to a lot of things. I, I, I always you know, we through, through my biology lab, we have it on 17 acres outside of Santa Rosa. We have an acre of hops. Showing off again. We, uh, we trade the hops. We, you know, we just we grow them organically and we, we trade them to uh, Fogwell Brewery for beer. And, and do you know, s- the whole idea is to get well, free beer, beer, right? beer is awesome and but, hops are um, awesome. Do do you see a, a, a increase in the terpene and resin? One other plant. The the terpene and resin production resin in the production and terpenes are critical. Absolutely, absolutely, and especially and if we're... the way to get there is manganese, plant esters, aminos... And that's what Uncle John's blend is. And being able to uh, share complex phosphorus and potassium right at the end and so, move it into the plant. But, but th- this is what sugar blows me... Sugar does not go into the plant. Yeah, see, this is what blows me away because the sugar, the, the byproduct of photosynthesis is sugar. That's the plant's energy, right? That's what it's right. producing. So... The sugar, when you talk about it being uptaken, is it uptaking where the plant can use, or is it just uptaken as a facilitator for the manganese and other, uh, such as, you know, other, other nutrients in the soil? Well, it's, you know, plants make sugar, and they excrete sugar out their roots, 
to stimulate and feed a diverse microbial population. You know, it's the, it's the microbiology that makes the chemistry available. And the sugar plant. feeds those. But That's the food towards source. Towards the end, the roots get a little bit rough, and the seed cells open up a little bit more, and they can actually take some sugar in. Okay. But that's only at the very end. And that's why, you know, we recommend using those products towards the end. You're you know, being last, honest with your you know, customers. Absolutely. At least five or six. You could tell them to use it the entire growth, bloom, whatever, which you should use if you're trying to uh, feed your microorganisms. However, if you're trying to run a sterile environment, you can forego the, some of those sugars until the end. Yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna uptake it until it needs it. You know, plants eat, they feed like robots. Hey, let me ask you this, John. You got the plant amp and the magne- uh, magnesium amp, the mag amp. Why separate the cow mag? Okay, because well, you know, I came up with the calcium first, and you know, I thought that everyone was onto these bloom boosters, you know, and cheap Chinese growth regulators and hormones to throw in them. But I knew that calcium, not phosphorus, is the most major component in plants. When you cut down a plant, if you ever see a hollow stem, that lack of calcium you just lost what? a third of your yield and a third of your quality, which oh almost makes it not worth doing. Mm-hmm. Calcium acts as the second messenger in plants. You need to have calcium in your plant in order for your plant to be in the right hormonal cycle, to be able to put out roots, shoots, or flowers or fruits at the right time. You know, it's all a rhythm thing. Right. So, you know, the key, the uh, chelating the calcium made it so that it wouldn't lock up with the phosphorus because that's what happens. Okay. You know, you add bone meal or something into the soil, it locks up in seven so, seconds. So, so, really se- it's available. so, so separate. Seven seconds is important to, you know, get it, try to get the roots really wet with it. And, right. So maybe it'll take some of it up. So is separating so, it because the plant needs like calcium, more calcium? You know, it was very important to uh, to work on, and I could have just thrown magnesium, and everybody wanted me to, and I want, didn't want to for a reason, because most of the early plant breeders were not farmers. They were people that went to Southeast Asia War. They were people who went into the Peace Corps, and when they came back, they started gardens in you know, place, remote, more remote places in Southern California, places in Northern California, Southern Oregon, and they grew crops, but they used dolomitic lime. Dolomitic lime is about 12 to 17 percent calcium and 52 percent magnesium. It's going to burn. Is <laughs> a problem with that? Right. And well, the ex- excess magnesium agitates the phosphorus. You, oh, no. You've got to have five parts calcium, one part magnesium, no matter what. And now I'm telling you, oh, no, it's different. It's only different because of the people who bred the plants to accept more magnesium. Right. And so I kept them separate because I wanted to show people that, look, here's what a calcium deficiency looks like. If you just use the calcium, Mm -hmm. you'll correct it. Here's what a magnesium deficiency looks like. If you use that, you'll correct it. And we Here's can fully apply. A, a cycle, you know, a schedule that you would use both of them, and it starts out five to one, but then it's like two to one by the time you finish. Well, why and is that? Is it because quality is better? Is it because the magnesium helps with the absorption of potassium and phosphorus towards the end, so you include more of it and less calcium? Or, or is it just wow? The, that's <laughs> Who am I talking to right now? That's heavy tea. This in is the Butthead. House. Ah, you're a smart man. Thank you. <laughs> that is, I have my moments. That is very right. Demonstrated fact, knowledge. You walk into, into situations and see this all the time. The petioles, the stem, leaf, the stem of the leaf, will look purple. Yep. And everyone goes, oh, it's a... Uh, Genetic. It's, it's a phosphorus deficiency or the thing is genetic even add more magnesium to overcome that deficiency right and then you don't have to add more phosphorus the phosphorus is you know all these fertilizer lines are just loaded with phosphorus so john let me get this right the whole cutting edge solution has been formulated to work in a symbiotic way the way the plant wants to use the nutrients we're all out here as growers trying to force more NPK, more cow mag, whatever it is at certain points, thinking that we're doing the plant some good when actually we're just adding more fodder that if we added the right components and lesser amounts, 
plant's going to be healthier. True. Do what it wants to do. Booyah! Yeah, yep. you're, you're, giving the, you're giving the plant a choice. And that's the and advantage you... of the foliar application. You know, with cow, uh, cow mags, typically they're, you know, salty and they've got, uh, you know, a DPTA and EDTA chelates. With plant amp and mag amp, our cow mag, you can apply it foliar. With the, with the full sunshine or under your 1,000 no watt doubt. HPSs, there's no salt in there. They're biochelated. That's and John yeah. can explain biochelation. Yeah, bi- biochelation. Tell the listeners the difference between bio compared to mineral chelation, John. Well, you know, there's a, you know, you mentioned EDTA, which I don't like to use, but unfortunately, manganese is one of the key uh, micronutrients to get quality out of crops. And the only manganese on the market is like EDTA chelated. So that's actually in our micro, or you know, the one that's red, the uh, you know, we call the biosynthetic one. Right. But Purple drink. The uh, <laughs> you know, it's not in our Sonoma line, which is the organic one. Okay. However, manganese in Uncle John's blend is biochelated, where you have a organic plant food source. You in your solution with. Uh, you know, potassium sulfate, iron sulfate, magnesium sulfate, and zinc sulfate. And you add the bacteria, and the bacteria will break off the sulfates. And then you add a fungi that feeds on the plant food source, and then it will enzymatically chelate the micronutrients. So, so, so it's, for it's, it's kind of like an amino key, amino acid chelation. So, and there are some companies that do specific amino acid chelations, and they're not bad. But, um, you know, what we do is different. Yeah, no, no. So let me get this right. It's it's an enzyme bonding to the nutrient molecule is basically, but it's biologically created through the bacteria. And then a mineral or as uh, acid fungi. chelation. Fungi it's a fungi. So, so, so is it is it basically the fungi eats the nutrient molecule, poops it out, and now it's biologically chelated, or is it that it bonds to it? It bonds to it. Okay, because there's a, there are a lot of misconceptions of what biological chelation are, mm-hmm. and you know there are things that become more readily available uh, through uh, the type of chelation where another organisms, a protozoa, so, uh, so forth, eats eats a molecule of fucking. Nematode eats that, poops it out, and now it's readily available to the plant. Also, through acids, amino acids, humic, fulvic acids, the acid bonds to it to help break down the cell wall as uh, to actually penetrate the cell wall to get the nutrient molecule into the plant more effectively. Absolutely. But what we're doing, or what you're doing, is using uh, the, the bacteria creating an enzyme, and the enzyme is what bonds to the nutrient molecule, thus making it more available to the plant. Yes. That's awesome. And that just means instant absorption. Yeah. That's well, awesome. You know, you're talking about directly into the plant's vascular system. So you, and right. for growers out there, everyone's trying to ball on a budget, or if you're running a large farm, it means you use less of everything. The plant, can, the plant can get what it needs without running a 2,500 part per million solution, Absolutely. Guys. We've got guys out in Sonoma County that are spraying plant amp on their grapes. We've got wineries that are using plant amp to get larger grape mass. And John already alluded to it, but if the plant is healthy, it's uptaking the nutrient effectively, it's going to be more resistant to pest, to pathogen. It's survival of the fittest. Mm-hmm. Pest and Heavier pathogen dry weight. attack sick plants. If your plant's healthy, they're more likely to move on. Just like our silica will provide. Hey, John. Yeah, um, like our like, foolproof SI, you know. It's, yeah, tell me about a, that. Uh, that's complex. It's not chelated because it's not a metal. But it's uh, enzymes from seaweed and uh pulling out the, uh, the silica source into, into silicon, and then it's amino acid complexed so that you get silicic acid. So it's like 5% silicic acid, which is what the plant wants to uptake. Right. And so it goes, you're, like you were saying, it goes right into the plant. And when you have the right balance of calcium and silicon, it builds, you know, the girth of the stalks is unbelievable, nice. even on small plants. And so people see it right away. And the leaves are get a little bit more leathery, and overall, it's better structure for the plant, and it's, that makes it, you know, more disease resistant. It's just its strength. That's awesome, man! All your products are so unique. 
Like, I don't think we, we could take up the whole four hours talking Absolutely. to John. John's blowing my mind away. <laughs> I, I've been working for him for three years, and my brain every single time is just like a, like a sponge. If you want to learn more, go to CuttingEdgeSolutions.com. Mark's going to hang out as guest analyst with all your grow questions. Yeah. While we still have John on the phone, though, I do have a Cutting Edge Solution question from Dustin in Maryland, guys. Here he comes. We have Dustin from Maryland. You've waited a while. For two hours. Go well, for hi, it, Dustin. Dustin. What's your grow question? Uh, Hey guys, how's it going? It's going good, Dustin. How are you? <clears throat> Pretty good. Um, all right. My question: I love your sour D and your sugary. First of all, the sugary is amazing. Um, right. My question is though: I'm going to actually start using your three part now. And how do I? What order do I mix? Do I do the micro first or the bulletproof first? Do the bulletproof first. Okay. Add the silica first, and do you let it mix in nice for two, for two to five minutes, John, or is it ready once it's in there to start mixing everything else? You know, you can just mix it and give it a stir. It's ready, in a, it's ready, like you say, in a minute or two. What, what if someone adds it at the end? I notice a clouding sometimes if people add silica at the end. Is that, uh, is that alluding to nutrient fallout? What, what is that? That's potassium silicate, and it, the silicate wants even more potassium. So it starts locking down the potassium, and then it just does a cascade of lockout of all these other things. You know, when, when, you, when you ask, what do I add first, because so many people are familiar with potassium silicate, yes. we want you to add the silicon first. Okay. Because so many people start something and maybe step away from it for a minute, we ask you to put the micro in first. You know, it's, it's kind of working with plants all these years. <laughs> It has been easier than trying to write instructions on labels for <laughs> everyone to follow. When Nick Young know. comes and says that, doesn't make sense. <laughs> Rewrite it. Keep going, but John. That's, you're that's there. The procedure: the bulletproof SI first, then the micro, and then if you're in the veg stage, you know it's the micro, the bloom, and the grow. So, and remember, Dustin, the the bulletproof isn't a potassium silicate; it's a salicylic acid. And there's a lot of overpriced uh, products on the market that are claimed to have salicylic acid in it. You get your uh, an affordable way to basically make your plants bulletproof and, and bring out the full health of them. And if you add that in conjunction with the plant amp or the mag amp, then you're going to be styling. And our dilution is only one mil per gallon on the bulletproof. Uh, some of our competitors, two to five mils per gallon. We're just one mil per gallon. Oh yeah, right on. And I guess I have to follow up with that then. How come some of the pH ups have potassium silicate in it, and you add your pH up last? Okay, my answer to that is never add pH up. Never. <laughs> right. It's, it's potassium hydroxide usually, but never add it. That that locks that locks too many things out. pH down is just phosphoric acid. You know, it's not so bad. People use our plant amp, and they're call it. They call us up. <laughs> they're like, "Why did the pH drop two points?" And I could have taken more organic acids out, but the plant finds those organic acids beneficial, and it absorbs those. So if you're in a recirculating system, you'll notice that the plant will balance the pH. Well, what about running with rock wool, John? Do you run into a problem when it's too acidic that the rock wool disintegrates? Do I run into a problem when what? Well, it, I've, I've seen with rock wool, if the, the solution is too acidic, like you're saying it dropped two points, let's say it dropped to four or five, that some, uh, sometimes it occurs where the rock wool will actually disintegrate in a too acidic environment. Have you guys run into any problems with that with the lower pH? No, I've, I've never I've never seen that happen before. You, you, you run you run Rockwell, yeah, Mark, and that's a very short swing. We use the term swing feeding. It's a very okay. low, uh, a short time where it's in that low pH range, so that it has access to certain nutrients that have a better uptake at a lower pH. So this is a very temporary effect, and the idea is to get access to the nutrients at all pH ranges. So the solution goes into the roots. The roots adjust the pH as needed and take what they need. And, and, as, the, and as, as it goes, will you notice a general rise like mo most yes. nutrient solutions? So you're, I, saying, you're saying that you don't even need to pH adjust your nutrient solution? Usually not for at least the three, first three or four days. So you, you mix everything up. You'll see on your first ebb and flow after you recollect and check your pH, you'll probably see a rise of about a half to a one point. Depends on your, you know, your, what your water starts with. 
But within usually 48 hours, as that chelated organic calcium is absorbed by the plant, the pH naturally rises back up to the, the target point. And that's at the only point where I'm going to maintain my pH, keep it around 5.5 for hydro or circulating. Right. Nice. Now, what if you're in a drain-the-weight system? What, what's your question? That's okay, too, because if you measure, you can pour on water that's at 3.5. Like, use our whole, whole fertilizer line, really strong in RO water and pour it on and just keep it running. And it keeps coming out the bottom, 6.5. How does it do that? It does that because plants will pull up water, break the hydrogen-oxygen bond, use some of the oxygens for some processes, use some of the hydrogens to build itself with carbon, and then excrete other hydrogen ions out their roots, adjusting the pH in the rhizosphere. So this whole measure of pH or potential hydrogen has been for like field crops right. because they want to know, huh, is, are things like manganese going to be available? Because manganese is a key micronutrient. Right. Manganese is the ability for plants to take up nitrogen, and it's only available to pH of 4. So plants have to work really hard to put a lot of hydrogen ions into the ground in order to be able to mine whatever manganese is down there. Manganese is key because all plants will make a, an enzyme that acts like a catalyst that lets nitrogen flow into the plant and through the plant without burning any cells. So you get, you know, so people go, wow, I run, I've run your line at, at a 2,800 parts per million in veg, and I got no burn. And I'm like, yeah, that's because you used the Uncle John's one that has the bioavailable manganese. And they're like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. Now pull that out on a plant and see what happens. <laughs> you know, the leaves will crisp right up. Right. But manganese is a key micronutrient in the uh, Cannabisiae family because, I mean, it's really well studied. You see Davis, you know, Corvallis, Hop Station, Puyallup. You know, there's all the literature coming out of there. Cornell in New York State. And uh, hops will take the manganese and make two coenzymes that boost the terpenes and the lupulin two to three percent. The lupulin is that like buzz effect you get on the strong IPAs. Right. And then the terpenes, once again the entourage effect, boosting the terpenes five hundred to a thousand percent. Whoa. That's where you get your flavonoid smell flavors effect you need that so basically use cutting edge solutions to grow the dink yeah and i'd like yeah. to chime in there real quick <laughs> y you know like i work for cutting edge and i've worked for john in july it'll be three oh, that's years that's why you're here yeah exactly oh, and the, the reason i work here i have no uh, stock options i have no ownership but the reason i work for them is this the finest nutrient i've ever used i've been in this business for 13 years you can't sell what you don't believe in exactly and i i, I grew with every other fertilizer and all of my contemporaries we had grow houses i've seen everything i've tried everything but when it came to the highest quality for the lowest price I ran cutting edge. It was the first time I ever saw two pounds under a light. Dang. And then I got addicted, and they all, the rest is history. American made, the prices are great, and that's why the big industrial And th farms. that's a big point. It's California made. It's American made. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's run by a family, it's, and they treat everyone that they work with like family. Uncle John. You know, the, the founder and innovator right here talking with us, John. Exploded my mind. John, I wish I had so much more time to talk with you, man. I want to give you a round of applause. Uh, Dustin, thank you for calling in from Maryland. I'm going to, I'm going to send Dustin some of that bulletproof. I'm also going to send him some smart pots and a light bulb from okay. Grow Light. What size light do you have, Dustin? Um, 600 watt. Can I get a blue? Yeah. I'll send him a 600 watt true blue, that bulletproof, and the smart pots to your local hydro store, which is where, brother? Uh, PA Hydroponics. PA Hydro. And we'll hey. drop some G-Rex in there from Cutting Edge Solution. That's our rooting product as well. Oh, okay, oh. man. Well, we're going to get more cool. into the other products, John. I got to take a break, man. I'm a little bit over. Um, but I want you down here in studio or call in again because you are a wealth of knowledge. And I know our listenership loves it and appreciates it Hell tremendously. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, you are actually a wealth of knowledge, too. You, you kind of shocked me with some of the things you said about phosphorus that are right on. And... You know, I don't usually, <laughs> I usually 
find the intelligence out there. Let me put it that way. Well, so, John, uh, John, we don't have to suck each other off. <laughs> just, just, teamwork makes the dream Just so work. you know, I, 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 I for the trade show, so I'd love to come by. Yeah, I, make sure you bring extra lotion. <laughs> it's going to be a long one. <laughs> uh, no, it's only a size seven, but if the bitch is fine, I'll stretch Hemp to a base. nine. Hey, John, I really appreciate it. CuttingEdgeSolutions.com. Their website is uh, being updated, but you can go to the original site, follow them on Instagram, follow them on Facebook, contact Mark, contact uh, anyone from the website. You're going to get answers to your grow questions if you're using Cutting Edge immediately. Lots of great stuff on Pinterest.com and all the grow forums. Just search for Cutting Edge Solutions. Take a look. Ooh, yeah. Awesome. Hey, thank John. Thank you. Thank you, brother. You have a good rest of your evening. Peace. Thanks, John. I love you. Peace and limit at least. Hey, let's take a quick break. We're coming back with Horty's Facebook Fucktard of the Week. Yes! Fucktard of the Week. You think we forgot about it? No, we didn't. It doesn't have anything to do with special kids getting hit by cars. <laughs> Unless it's Dr. Duff. Special kids need the most attention. CuttingEdgeSolutions.com. Check it out. Listen to our sponsors. American DFC Media. Radio. Dot com. NorCal represent. Heaven to your You're listening to DFCRadio.com.